and all of our friends and visitors who are here, uh, welcome to our Sunday worship. And we're all so glad that you can be joining us. 
Um, you know, uh, at this time, we're going to be going through some announcements. And um, we want to say, first of all, if you're new and you're visiting and you're here for the first time, uh, we'd love to get to know you. Even if you're not from the area, you're from somewhere else, uh, we're going to be setting up a Zoom meeting channel right after worship. And that Zoom link and the password will be in our description. So if you just check the YouTube description, uh, you'll have all the information there. And immediately after the benediction, uh, we really hope to see you there. Uh, we have some really exciting announcements coming up. Uh, we have a new ministry that a couple of sisters have put together, and they're calling this Be Together. And what a fitting name it is, because at this time, um, nothing is more important than for us to be together. And the purpose of this ministry would be for uh, women of Mosaic, uh, all ages, from the young to the old, to gather together, to come together in fellowship, in prayer, uh, to uh, uh, do studies, but ultimately to grow in Christ. And in this particular season, they wanted to do the book reading on uh, Emotional Healthy Spirituality by Pete Scazzaro. And... Um, <laughs> And, um, you know, it's, it's a perfect book right now because uh, we're doing our sermon series on this. So uh, if you're interested, uh, please order this book. You can get it on Amazon. And uh, you can email Janie, and her email is ho.janie at gmail.com right here below. So uh, get this book and email her, and you'll be right on their list. And their first meeting is going to be this Saturday, May 9th at 1030 a.m. And speaking of May 9th, we also have uh, an, another uh, exciting um, an, uh, you know, event planned out. So later on in the day at 4 p.m., we're going to have a Mother's Day tea party. And this is an invitation for all mothers of Mosaic, whether you're an expected mom or whether you're a mom who already sent their kids off to college. But it's for all moms to come together and they would like to share a word and reflect on God's steadfast love and uh, how to be encouraged uh, during these times. So uh, the, the leadership did their best to reach out to all the mothers in Mosaic. But just in case, if they missed you, please uh, forgive us. But uh, we want you to email younghee1 at hotmail.com. And that is her email down here below. And uh, yeah, we're really excited for this ministry for the mothers to get together and really encourage one another. Also, uh, there's a need in our local community, our Norwood Food Pantry. Uh, they're in need of your help. So right now, they need drivers, and they also need sorters. So um, they're asking for one to two hours uh, in a day, and whether that's once a week, twice a week, or even five days a week, uh, they're very flexible with their timing, but they really need your help. So whether you'll be the driver who will bring the food to the patrons, or you're going to gather the food, and you're going to sort them, and then put them into individual bags to deliver them, uh, they need your help. So please, if you're interested, email bob33weiss at gmail.com, and his email will be down here as well. And um, uh, we really hope to see you out there. And also, uh, we cannot forget our missionaries uh, who are out there during these tough times as well. And we have their updated uh, missionary quarterly report. So for those who would like to uh, receive that, email me, pastoryosap at gmail.com, and uh, please continue to join us in prayer and support for them. And lastly, uh, our planning center registration has been going well. So if you have not yet registered, we want to encourage you, please go to your phone apps, uh, go to Church Center, and this is the logo down here, and download it. It'll just take a few minutes. And if you have already downloaded it, uh, you could actually update uh, your profile to more details. So at the top right of your app, you're going to see this kind of person silhouette um, icon. And uh, you click that, and you can update your um, profile information, but also you can go to groups and you can join groups. So if you're already in small group, please go to groups, pick your small group and join. And um, we're going to be really utilizing this platform. So we're really excited. So please download the app and uh, we hope to see you there. Well, that's it for our announcements. And at this time, please join us as we praise and lift up worship to our God. Good morning, Mosaic. It's Sunday again, so you know what that means. It's time to worship together. Um, even though we can't see you, we are delighted in knowing that we can worship in unity, in spirit, and in truth. And so let's praise our God together. Thank you. 
from 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. This passage has really been on my heart because um, I think the quarantine is forcing a lot of us to be confronted with deeper issues that we might have or maybe even weaknesses that we weren't aware of or maybe they're even more magnified because we have nowhere else to go and we have nothing to um, cover them with. And so... I hope this verse will encourage you as we enter into a time of confession. Um, Paul says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. This is Jesus speaking. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And our God is such a good God that he doesn't tell us to be good and then leave us in our depravity but he tells us in our weakest moments that's when he is made strong in us and it's through our weaknesses that his grace can be um, exalted and so let's really give up our weaknesses to God at this time in confession whatever sins you may be struggling with um and maybe you don't feel weak. Maybe in your mind you feel strong. And in a lot of ways that's a sin too. So let's bring everything before the Lord. No, no arrogance, um, no conceit, no sense of entitlement. But with surrender, come before him um, and receive his forgiveness and trust that his word is true. So let's pray together.
Father, we just want to thank you, God, for um, being worthy of our praise and for being a father that does not forsake us, God, in our weakest moments. And um, Lord, we want to call upon your name as a God who is able. Lord, we pray at this time for more and more awareness, Lord, of how you are working in our lives. Um, more and more awareness, Father, of how broken we are, God, so that as we recognize our brokenness, we would turn to you, Lord, to be our strength. And um, we just want to thank you that um, in your name there is freedom, and in your Son there is power to be made new. And we thank you, God, for this redemptive love, um, and we pray, God, for courage to really live out um, in it, in, in um boldness, Father, for your glory. So we thank you, God, for this time, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hi, Mosaic. I'm here today to share my testimony regarding the EHS series, and I wanted to just share how God has transformed me emotionally, healthy spirituality in 2020. So last year, going back to November, I had just came back from an amazing women's Barnabas trip. Um, but then when I returned back to church and Sunday worship, I started to not sing or not praise during the worship time. I just felt like a Christian zombie going through the motions, but not having any heart or sincerity in what I was doing. Uh, a couple Sundays passed of me doing this and I just started to feel more doubts. And these doubts started to ask questions such as, am I a Christian fraud? And why am I unable to praise a God whose works I just amazingly witnessed in Morocco? It was truly a time where I was puzzled with myself and my spirituality. And I started to turn those doubts into self-hatred. And then slowly and surely, all the things I was suffering or feeling throughout 2019 started to seep deeper into my heart. And a lot of these pressures were from asking myself, why am I not a good enough worker at work? And why am I not a good enough daughter to my family? Why am I not a good enough friend? And why am I not a good enough Christian? It's really ironic that my name is Grace, but during this time, I was not showing myself any grace. There was an internal voice that kept repeating, God does not want to hear your voice. Satan stole my joy and praise where I could only pray during worship. And this moment changed when I attended a YWAM DTC a discipleship lecture. And the title of the lecture was appropriately called Worship. During this time, the speaker allocated a time of deep prayer uh, as worship music was just playing in the background. He challenged us to just truly be in the presence of his spirit and to just pray and cry out to God, whatever was on our heart. And so of course I naturally cried out my frustrations and my pains and my worries about why I couldn't praise again since November. And then I slowly felt that God was taking away the lies that Satan had planted and he revealed that true worship is returning to the heart of freedom and truth that we are set free only by his grace and that God loves to hear my voice. No matter how off key or how badly I may sound, he still loves to hear my voice. He is a God of goodness and love. And so if the voices I'm hearing is not sounding like those things, then they're not from God. My heart of worship reignited when I was reading 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, where it says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. So my inner self should not waste away as a religious zombie believing the lies of Satan. All along, God wanted to renew my heart in him and develop a habitual relationship with him, 
where I communicate and lean on him daily. So from then on, how can I not praise and give thanks to such a loving God? With a reignited heart, I'm glad to say I'm able to praise again and delight in his worship. It is a spiritual liberation in peace where I know I'm never alone in my sorrows and I don't have to fall under the pressures of being enough. Uh, in God's eyes, fortunately, I'm already enough. It's a breakthrough where I recognize that worship is really powerful for his kingdom. And I can't help but be thankful that every day I never have to face my pains alone. So I recognize that spiritual battles were happening to me and they will continue to happen to me in the future because I'm on the right path um, and right spiritual path with God. Satan doesn't want us to have a close relationship with God and he actually hates that the most. So Satan actually oppresses the hardest on those who are destined for God's goodness and greatness. So when I hear the lies of the enemy now, um, I actually just right away go to God by constantly communicating in prayers, reading his word and either praising or just simply listening to worship songs. I don't have to wallow in my self-doubts anymore and I don't have to live in self-hatred. There is a renewed reality now where the posture of my heart changed into a heart of thankfulness, a heart of peace and heart of grace. A reminder of God's freedom can be found in Emily P. Freeman's book called Graceful, Letting Go of Your Try Hard Life. It says, because of Jesus, you are enough, you are secure, you are the salt of the earth, you are cared for, you are seen, you are forgiven, you are free, you have hope, God is enough, and you will be filled with his enoughness. He made you to be his beloved. So church, I hope we can all remember that. And I pray that we can daily uproot the lies and pains in our hearts and let God replace them with his grace and freedom for us. Today's scripture reading will come from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 12 and 19 to 21. Hear now the word of God. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be appropriation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of God. Good morning, Mosaic. I hope you're well. Uh, we miss you, and I hope that you've been uh, healthy and that you guys have found uh, joy in the Lord in the midst of the quarantine. Um, my prayer for you guys is that you would make your homes into homes of worship, that you would make your houses into houses of worship. And I know it's not easy uh, doing that, the place where you rest and you, and you play, uh, to make that into churches, but I really want to encourage you to do that, um, to take that time and to make now a, a house of worship in your homes, in your living rooms. Um, I think that's what is most pleasing to the Lord. And so I just want to uh, remind you that in these times um, of virtual worship, that you would use that time and to, and to put in the work uh, to make your homes into homes of worship um, as we gather on Sundays. You know, my daughter, uh, second daughter, Sophia, uh, she's about one years old, a um, little bit more than one years old, and she started to do something funny in the house. Um, you know, this is the time when she starts to learn words. She starts to learn words like, this is a banana, this is mom, this is dad, this is water, um, this is that. And she has this baby doll, and, and the baby doll, she, she says, baby, baby, because we told her that that's a baby doll. 
But, uh, you know, that's normal. Every baby does that. Uh, but she's been doing something interesting lately. And, um, you know, when we talk to Sophia, we, we uh, reference her. We always say Sophie or Sophia. Uh, that's what we say to her. But she started doing something interesting lately. She's not just repeating things, but recently she's called herself, referenced herself as baby, baby. And that's interesting to me because we don't call her baby. We call her by her name. And what I realized is she's doing something very interesting. She's looking at pictures of babies in uh, books. She's looking at babies in videos. She's looking at her baby doll. And then she looks in the mirror and she sees herself and she realizes, oh, baby, baby, I'm a baby. And I thought that that was so interesting because that takes a lot of self-awareness, right? To process the information, to look at yourself and to say, baby, Um, Some of the other parents who are listening might not think that that's so fascinating, but for me, as the father, uh, that is really interesting to me because she's doing something new. Uh, She's referencing herself. She's processing information and understanding who she is um, in relation um, to other things. I also think that that self-awareness is really rare uh, among adults. It's really rare among adults because we don't really take the time to process where we are and who we are. And because of that, uh, we end up becoming very emotionally immature. Um, We lose out on understanding ourselves. And because we're emotionally immature, uh, we face um, some consequences that we don't need to face if we just take the time to assess ourselves. And so today, I want to do that. I want to spend some time assessing where we are, but I want to do that, assess ourselves by the Word of God. And so when you look at the letter of 1 John, what you see is that the Apostle John tells us that the ethic that we're supposed to use to assess where we are spiritually and emotionally as Christians, as followers of Jesus, is we're supposed to use love, love that comes from the Father. That tells us uh, kind of who we are and where we are in the spectrum of maturity. And so we're going to do that. We're going to take a look at this passage, and we're going to try to understand where we are and how we can grow into the future. And so these are the three ideas that... um, the sermon breaks down to first, we're going to look at this new script of love that comes from God our Father, and then we're going to look at emotional immaturity. How do we understand where we are in our uh, maturity? And lastly, how do we grow? How do we grow into this ethic of love? Uh, Brothers and sisters, um, I I think the Lord has something special uh, for you today. He has a word for you today, um, a word that's not only going to impact you, but is also going to bless friends and family, people around you in your life. And so in your homes, would you pray with me? And uh, will you bow your heads as we come to the word of God? Father, we pray uh, that you would be with us in our homes. We pray that you would make our homes in the houses of worship. And we pray that you would help us so that in our homes, we would be able to receive the word of God. And we believe we can because the spirit sends the word of God to us in our homes and in our living rooms and has a purpose uh, for us. And so, Father, we want to make our hearts available now to you. We know that it's challenging because we're not in the atmosphere that we're used to for worship. But we pray that the spirit will give us extra blessing extra grace, extra mercy, so that we can do this work of receiving your word properly so that it can actually change us. Father, we pray that the the, the word of God would help us to look at ourselves as a mirror and finally to look at you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we want to first look at this new script of love. Um, When you look at verse 7 and 8 of our passage, this is what it says. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. You know, last week we learned about family. And we learned about how family impacts our lives today even as adults. And we learned about this uh, kind of term, uh, family scripts or scripts um, that we learned about last week. And we learned that there are all of these scripts that are inside of us. And essentially this is what a script is is that we we were given as we were brought up. Scripts are unspoken approaches. We learn and then we reenact in our lives. You know, they're unspoken approaches to life that we learn and we reenact um, in our lives. They're things that were instinctively planted in us that maybe our moms and dads didn't sit us down and tell you, uh, this is how you should think about this and this is how you should think about that. Rather, we just saw them uh, live their lives 
and we em embodied those things so that in our adult life, uh, this is how we approach the very same things in our lives. And there are so many different family scripts. There are family scripts that we picked up um, that talks about money, family scripts about anger, about sex, about friendships, how do friendships work, about keeping secrets, about work, about how do we have fun, how much fun is allowed, um, about vacations. We learn all of these scripts because our parents didn't sit us down and teach us about each of these things. And we, don't, we didn't ever stop and think about each of these things. We need shortcuts because you're not going to sit and think for a couple of days about vacations, but you need shortcuts. You need shortcuts in your life because your life moves fast. And so instead of thinking through these things, what we do is we just model. And we just copy how we grew up. And so these are family scripts. Um, and let me just give you one example uh, so you understand what this is like. Uh, one example of these family scripts is money. You know, how we understand money um, is really important, and, and kind of our adult uh, approach to money is often embedded to us, into us, um, as we were adolescents and young adults. Um, and let me tell you how it works. Maybe you grew up, and your parents never talked about money. And maybe one of the reasons they never talked about money was that money uh, was so scarce. And because money was so scarce, they fought about money all the time. They fought about money all the time, and it was always a point of contention and tension in uh, your family, and so you always avoided talking about money. And so as you grew up, there's this kind of growing uh, desire in you to have a lot of money, because if you have a lot of money, it's going to bring freedom and release, because, you know, your family was always so tight-lipped about money. It was always this kind of tense thing in your family, and so you desire to have some money, because it will bring some release, you know, to you. Some of us grew up with that script. It's very familiar to me. But then, as adults, you begin to budget. And when you begin to budget, you're essentially limiting yourself when it comes to money. Limiting and limiting and limiting. And that can be hard when you grew up with that family script. When you desire that when you grow up and you have some money that you're going to be able to enjoy it. Right? And you're going to be able to find release and freedom in money. And so when you begin to budget, it's a painstaking process because it's like a self-imposed poverty. It feels like um, you're being forced to go back to your old way of life, of that kind of trap and of those chains. And so budgeting is really hard, and so you don't even think about it. And without realizing, you reenact your family script of you don't talk about money, you avoid it at all costs. And when the topic comes up, it's really tense. Some of you are married, and your spouse has imposed upon you a budget. And that's even harder. That's even worse, because you feel like they're imposing upon you the poverty that you've been trying to escape. And so you blow up when conversations about money come up. You see, we have all these scripts that we've picked up um, as young people. And what we learned last week is that as we become adopted into the family of Christ, as we come into uh, the new family under God the Father, we have all these new scripts that we learn, that the Father is giving us all these new scripts and transforming the way that we grew up and, and taking our scripts and redeeming them and changing the way that we approach things according to his word. John tells us that one of those things that come down to us as a script from God is love. We are born into God, and when we are born into God, uh, we receive this new script of love. Read verse 7 and 8 with me one more time. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not know God, uh, who does not love, does not know God, because God is love. You know, scripts always start from parents and grandparents, people above us. And what John is telling us is that God the Father, the father of our new adopted family, has handed down to us a new script, and this new script that's from him is love. And so if we are part of this new family, we are to embody this new ethic and this new family script of love. But the thing is, this family script is very specific. Um, it's not the kind of love that we think. You know, and so John makes pains to try to help us to understand the kind of love that he's talking about. And in verse 9, he says this, 
in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. He's going to define it for us now. He says this, that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. You see, he defines the kind of love that he's talking about as sacrificial action. Sacrificial action. That's our new family's script. That's our brand of love because that's God's brand of love. You know, it's a far cry from the feelings love that we're talking about. And the reason that John is really trying to explain it here is that so easily we can impose our view of love on what he's talking about, right? Uh, We can think that our version of love is what God is talking about. And so John wants to make sure that we're not misunderstanding him. I don't know, have you ever had a conversation with someone and you're trying to explain something and you're trying to get your point across and you're trying to really uh, communicate with them and they're kind of nodding their head, listening, but there's something about you as you're talking, you feel like he doesn't understand what I'm saying, right? There's that, it kind of rises up instinctively inside of you, right? Like you're nodding your head, but you really don't understand what I'm saying. And so you say, "Um, are you sure you, you get what I'm saying? And they say, yeah, yeah. I understand what you're saying. And you say, okay, well, can you tell it back to me? Because I get this weird feeling that you don't get me. And they repeat it back to you. And you say, no, 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 no. And that's why I wanted you to repeat it back to me. Because I feel like we're saying the same words, but we're meaning totally different things. And I feel like when I read verses 9 and 10 of our passage, that's what John is doing. He's trying to define this new love of our family, of the family of God, Because so easily we can misunderstand him. And I think he's saying, you don't get me. Read verse 10. He goes even further. He says, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see what he's saying? He says, listen to me, family. I'm not talking about the way that we love God. I'm talking about the way that God loves us. That's what we're to embody. This is love. Not the way that you think about love, but this is love. Are you listening? He sent his son to sacrificially die for us. This is the kind of love that we need to embody in our new family. Not the kind of feeling love that you're talking about. Right? That's the kind of love that we normally resort to. And that's why John has to be really clear. You're not hearing me. When husbands and wives say, yeah, I love my wife, I love my husband, you know, I I love them in my heart, I would do anything for them. And then your husband or wife says, but you don't. There are things that I ask you to do that you don't do. And then the husband and wife says in response, oh, but I would do anything for you. Uh, You know, it's in my heart, you know, in my heart, and that's what counts. I feel like the Apostle John would put his palm to his face like this and say, no, you still don't get what I'm saying. Sacrificial love in action. Love in action. That's our new family script. And there are two things that are required for us to do that. First, in order for us to act in sacrificial love, our new family script, it's required that we put ourselves in someone else's shoes. We need to put ourselves in someone else's perspective in order to understand to love them. Secondly, we have to act sacrificially. These are two really important elements of sacrificial love. Now, many of you knew that. Those of you who grew up in the church, you knew that. That's not new information to you. But my question today to you is not, is it new to you, but is it, it's why don't you do it? My question to you is, is not that, is this profound and new for you, but my question is, why can't we do it? And I would like to say that one of the reasons that we can't do it is that we are too emotionally underdeveloped to actually put this into practice. You knew all the stuff I just said, didn't you? None of that was new. But you haven't been living it. And one of the reasons that you haven't been living it and I haven't been living it is that we're too emotionally underdeveloped, too emotionally immature to actually live it out. You see, and today, in order for us to overcome that, we have to see where we are in our emotional immaturity. We have to, like my daughter said, look at ourselves and be able to assess ourselves. 
And this is how uh, we can do that. And so the second thing I want to, to talk to you about is emotional immaturity. How do we recognize then all of these underdevelopments in our emotions? How do we recognize it? Because physically, it's easy. You know, you understand your physical underdevelopments by looking at physical indicators. But when it comes to emotional and spiritual underdevelopment, how are we supposed to know? How are we supposed to know um, where we are emotionally? Uh, Pete Scazzaro in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, gives us a, a few helps. Now, um, I would like to say that these, this is not perfect, but these are some helpful indicators and tools, right? But don't think that this is going to be everything for you. Uh, he tells us what it looks like when someone is an emotional infant, when someone's an emotional child, and when someone is an adolescent emotionally. And so we're going to put these up, and so you could read these. Um, but here, here's his description for emotional infancy. This is what an emotional infant looks like. An emotional infant looks for others to take care of them. An infant has great difficulty entering into the world of others. Emotional infants are driven by a need for instant gratification, and infants use others as objects to meet their needs. Moving on from there, the second category before um, they reach adolescence and finally emotional adulthood is emotional children are content and happy as long as they receive what they want. Uh, this is a little bit different from infancy in that they're not driven only by instant gratification, but when they meet challenges, they unravel quickly from stress, disappointments, and trials. Children interpret disagreements as personal offenses. They're not able to separate the issue from them personally. Uh, children are easily hurt. They complain. They withdraw, manipulate, take revenge, become sarcastic, when they don't get their way, right? Sometimes sarcasm is used uh, because they're too underdeveloped to actually address the issues in a constructive way. So sarcasm is kind of like this other way out. They have great difficulty calmly discussing their needs in a mature, loving way. Now, the third level before adulthood is adolescence. And here's what emotional adolescents look like according to Pete Scazzaro. He says they tend to be defensive. They're threatened and alarmed by criticism but they're also critical themselves of other people. Uh, they keep score of what they give so they can ask for something in return. They deal with conflict very poorly, often blaming, appeasing, going to a third party, pouting, or ignoring the issues completely. And it's not like they're looking for others to constantly take care of them like emotional infants, but they are very preoccupied with themselves. And so they only take care of themselves. And lastly, they have great difficulty listening to another person's pain, disappointments, and needs. Pete Scazzaro says that these are the stages of emotional infancy, childhood, and adolescence. Um, this is how uh, many of us are. Now, for me, it's not a perfect uh, categorization because I see a lot of overlap, right? Um, but for me, I just want to, to show you three themes that I see in there that we should be aware of so we can assess where we are. The first common theme that I see in all of them is a lack of awareness of other people, right? That's what you see in all three of them is this great uh, perspective that you can't break out of where you're so self-centered in your perspective. And a person has such great difficulty understanding uh, what another person's perspective is, and they're trapped and held captive in their own emotions, right? It's like when we say, I can't imagine why you would say that. I can't imagine uh, what your position is, how you could ever see it that way. Right? There's a lot of emotional immaturity in politics, right? But even when we try to love, when we're emotionally underdeveloped, even when we try to love, oh, Pastor Dave preached the sermon on love, and so this week I'm going to try to love. But then when our emotional muscles are underdeveloped and we're immature, we execute poorly because we're, we're not ready yet. We need to continue to grow. One of the ways we execute poorly in this is that because we can't understand another person's perspective, we love them exactly how we would want to be loved. We pretend like they're emotional clones of ourselves, and so we do to them exactly how we would want to be done to us. Uh, Pete Scazzaro says, I naturally want people around me to give themselves up and become what I want them to be. I prefer those close to me to think, feel, and act toward the world the same way that I do. And I love this phrase, I prefer the illusion of sameness. The illusion of sameness. The illusion that you're exactly like me. And so when, even when I try to love you, 
I love you like you are me. Brothers and sisters, when Jesus says, love your neighbor as you love yourself, that's not what he's talking about. He's not saying love them exactly the way that you would be loved because they are made uniquely different from you. But when we're emotionally underdeveloped, we can't even fathom that someone has a different world than us, has someone has a different perspective than us, and so we just love them exactly how we would want to be loved. This is a lack of awareness of other people. And so because I like to be talked to directly, I talk directly to you. When we're in conflict, because I want to be left alone, I'll leave you alone. I'm sure that you want to eat exactly what I want to eat, right? That, you know, this exposes in us an emotional underdevelopment, an immaturity where we can't step out of our own shoes in our self-awareness and step, in, step into the shoes of other people. This is one area where we may need to look in the mirror and say, baby, I am a baby in this area. And it's okay. We need to continue to assess ourselves because the worst thing is for us to be in denial and refuse to grow and keep being frustrated in our love. The second common theme I see in all of these indicators is the the way that immature people use people instead of love them. Use people instead of love them. Uh, We use them as instruments and we use them as means to our own happiness rather than understanding that they are whole people seeking the happiness uh, for themselves. Uh, We use people. Uh, There's a Jewish theologian named Martin Buber, and he invented this idea of um, I-it relationships, right? And what he means by that is that underdeveloped people, what we do is uh, we we treat ourselves as fully orbed people with our own desires, our own dreams, our own perspectives. But then for other people, we treat them like pseudo-humans or objects, And so we objectify them. We use them as objects only to obtain our own happiness. And so some examples that Schizero gives in his book is when you walk in and you dump work on your secretary's desk without even saying hello, without even observing that he or she has his own, you know, world, that he had his own weekend, that he has his own thoughts. Instead, he's just an instrument for your happiness. Uh, you talk about people in authority as if they're subhuman. You talk about leaders and, and government people as if they're just robots with no lives and with no um, desires and pains of their own. Maybe you talk about church leadership that way. I treat my spouse and my children as if they don't have their own perspective and autonomy. And I love this one. In the church, I attend to people only if they serve the church. It's a challenge for pastors, leaders, that we only really attend to people according to their utility to our church. That's a really bad one. But it, it exposes an, uh, an emotional immaturity in us to treat people according to their utility rather than them as people. And I think that it's really just an extension of the first um, inability to see past your own desires. Because I can't see your desires, because I can't step into your perspective, I just impose my perspective on you. I impose my needs and desires on you. And we basically just look at people for their utility. That's one of the reasons that immature Christians, you know, when they first come to faith, can't understand You know, I want to worship God and I want to love God, but why do I need to get involved in the mess of other people at church? I don't understand. I could come to church, I could worship God, I can get my sermon, I can get what I need, but I don't understand this whole community thing. I don't understand why I need to get like involved in the mess of other people's lives. Can I be a Christian? Can I worship God and follow Jesus without getting into the you know, burden of other people. You know, for those people, you know, we have to be patient with them because they're still underdeveloped. Because that's a way of looking at people through just the lens of utility, how we can use them. And this is a second area where we might need to confess, baby, I am a baby. Lastly, uh, the third uh, common theme that I see is conflict. Conflict. The inability to deal with conflict constructively um, when we are emotionally immature. 
You see, when we're emotionally underdeveloped, conflict is so hard. In fact, I think conflict is sometimes uh, the best indicator. There's nothing that exposes your immaturity more like conflict and criticism. Um, it's, it's one of the things that really exposes us because emotionally immature Christians, what we do is we either avoid conflict altogether or we're unable to deal with it constructively or we just want to fight. Again, it's the inability to see beyond yourself, to step outside of yourself in the midst of conflict, to look at the situation, to desire a resolution of the situation. You can't do that when you're emotionally underdeveloped because all you can do is think about your own hurt. All you can do is think about your own pain. All you can do is be held captive by your own emotions. You don't have the emotional muscles yet to move forward. And so, brothers and sisters, um, I know it's painful to take this kind of look at ourselves, but it's useful. It's useful because we need to understand where we are and to come to this place of repentance. We need to come to this place of repentance. You know, the Hebrew word for repentance is shuv. It means to make a U-turn. It means to turn away from our old ways and turn towards the ways of God. If we don't take time to assess where we are emotionally and spiritually, we will never repent. And for those who don't repent, we reject the grace and mercy of growth. You know, Paul is talking to the Corinthians who think that they're so mature because they have all these spiritual gifts, right? Because they have so many outward gifts, they think they're so mature. And Paul is talking to them and he wants to wake them up from this. And after he goes through the chapter on love, he says this. He says, when I was a child, Corinthians, listen, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. He says, I was a kid once, spiritually, emotionally. But when I saw love, I had to give up my childish ways. I had to learn how to step out of my perspective and I had to mature. He says, I was a child too. I was emotionally and spiritually underdeveloped too. But we have to recognize that and begin to move forward and come out of these ways. And so how do we do that? Lastly, how to mature. I think the path to mature, it starts off with what we have been doing. We need to look at where we are first. We need to understand where we are first. We have to see and assess ourselves, and we have been doing that. After we do that, we need to begin to repent of our childish ways, of our immaturity, and begin to move through repentance towards maturity and growth. So you have assessment, you have repentance, and then you have the third step here, which is looking to Christ. Looking to Christ. Because only by looking at Christ do we actually begin to grow towards him and the spirit works in us so that we become like him. You see, Jesus Christ shows us and gives us this sacrificial love for us. In John 12, 23, he tells his disciples, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. It's time, it's time. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. You see what he's saying there? He says, it's time for me to be glorified. It's time for me to go on to the next step. But the only way I could go on to the next step is this. I have to die. You see, I have the choice not to die. I have the choice not to die. But if I don't die, then I I will remain alone. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, if I don't die, then the only person who is going to be accepted by the Father, loved by the Father, brought into the family of the Father, is going to be saved and justified, the one who's going to be glorified, the only one who's going to be glorified then, if I choose not to die, is me. Jesus Christ will always be the perfect Son of God. And he says, if I choose not to die, then the seed will remain alone. But if I die, if I choose to die in this moment now, as I transition to the next step, 
in God's plan, if I die, I will not be the only seed. I will not be alone, but I will bring others with me into glory. I will bring others with me into love. If I enter into the perspective and world of sinners, and if I die, then you will also with me come into this salvation and this love. Jesus understands that. If I sacrifice and if I love, then I will not be alone in salvation, but I will bring many sons to glory. You see, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you today that sacrificial love is not just the script of the father and the new family, but sacrificial love is how you got saved. It's not just the father's DNA in our new family. Sacrificial love is how you got saved. You know, I remember in high school, when I was in high school, they started coming out with these machines that they were installing all over the, the locker rooms and in the gyms and things like that. It was called a defibrillator. I'm not even sure if I'm saying it right right now, but I remember being a high school kid, and they were going through this big process of installing defibrillators all around the school. And I had no idea what a defibrillator was, and I still don't actually know uh, the ins and outs of it, but I remember them installing these things and telling us how amazing these things were um, and how important these things were in our school. Defibrillators, um, they help a person when um, they stop breathing and their heart is uh, in a bad situation, right? It's used oftentimes along with CPR. I had no idea what a defibrillator was. And so for me, I didn't care, and I was annoyed that they kept talking to us about these defibrillators. That was until I, I, I heard a, uh, a story about a student in a different school who actually, I, I think that he went, to, went under cardiac arrest. Something happened where his heart wasn't working correctly, and they used the defibrillator to bring him back to life. I remember hearing uh, that story from my friend and you know, for me, that whole thing about them installing these machines around school, I was an outsider. I didn't really care. It didn't really affect me. But you know, for that kid, for the rest of his life, he is going to believe in defibrillators because defibrillators saved his life. You know, even for me, uh, e even, you know, for me, it, it didn't really touch me on the inside, but for him, it was personal to him because defibrillators saved him. You know, brothers and sisters, when it comes to sacrificial love, when it comes to this new family script of sacrificial love, you and I, who are followers of Jesus, we can't talk like sacrificial love is something that is outside of us because sacrificial love is what saved us. We have been marked by sacrificial love. The reason that you and I are Christians is not because mommy and daddy took you to church when you were kids, but because God decided to act in sacrificial love and he saved you through it. And so in our Christian walks, as we follow Jesus, that has to be personal for us, just as the defibrillator was personal now for that kid. We are that kid. Sacrificial love is not a concept outside of us, but sacrificial love is what saved us. That DNA is not just his. That DNA is ours. Because the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one in all eternity who could have decided, I don't understand these people. I don't understand them. I don't understand their perspective. And he was totally right because he was God, unstained by sin. And he was looking at all these sinners and he was the only one who could rightfully say, I don't understand their perspective. I don't want to step into their perspective. But he didn't do that. You see, he's the only one who could have just used us instead of love us. He's the only one that could have made us um, into just objects of utility. But he didn't do that. He's the only one that could have looked at the conflict between sinners and God and said, I don't want to resolve this. I will avoid it. And he would have been completely justified. I will destroy them. And he would have been completely justified. But that's not our father. That's not our father. God is love. As John tells us in our passage. And he didn't do that. He stepped into sacrificial love. He stepped into our situation. He emptied himself of his perspective and came into ours. 
He loved us for our own sake, and he saved us that way. That's how you were saved. So now sacrificial love is something that is deeply embedded in your spiritual DNA. Brothers and sisters, in verse 25, Jesus says, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Sacrificial love is our new family script that Jesus gives to us. It's what we measure our emotional maturity against, and it's what we ought to strive for. And only by looking at Jesus and stepping into the gospel again will we actually begin to mature and move away from our childish ways. As I close, can I just give you two ways you can apply this this week? Number one, one of the ways that we can begin to apply this is by becoming a good listener. We need to become a loving listener to those who are around us. You know, that's the primary way we enter into someone else's life. You know, our inability to step out of our own perspective, you know, our childish ways, the way that we move beyond that is we actually start by becoming loving listeners, by listening well. When you're in conversation, put your own agenda, your own thoughts on hold and just listen. It's okay if you don't have something to say back right away, but to intentionally listen to their perspective and understand their perspective and show them that you are under, you're understanding them and that you have given them your loving attention. You know, many of you are interacting with your small groups and others through Zoom. Maybe you're even interacting through family members, uh, through video conference. Even on video conference, try to extend loving listening towards them. Don't multitask as uh, they're uh, looking at you in the camera. As they're talking to you, don't be doing something else while they're talking to you. One of the ways that we can love people, even in the time of COVID-19, is to connect with people, to understand them, to listen to them. Right? Give them your attention and actually give your listening ear to their perspective and try to step into their perspective without judgment. I want to ask you, who is the one person that you have not given a listening ear to? It might be somebody very, very close to you. This week, reach out and give a listening ear. Stop doing stuff and listen and enter into their perspective because that's the first step towards sacrificial love. And when you feel that frustration, when you disagree with them, uh, when you can't understand why in the world would they think that way, and you're just so impatient with their perspective, and you have so much to say back, remember your Lord Jesus Christ, who for 33 years was patient and bore with us, and he was patient with sinners, and he stepped into the world of sinners, prostitutes, and tax collectors to save you. That's your testimony. That's how you were saved. Secondly, not only become a loving listener, but this week, engage in painful love. Engage in painful love. Do an act of love that is painful and that hurts you. There's so many ways uh, that you can love sacrificially right now in the midst of what's going on. You can give, you can give uh, to people. You can give in a way that actually impacts your finances. Give until it hurts, until you feel it. You can make masks at home. Give up your time and your energy to do that. And you can volunteer. You know, Mosaic, we're uh, volunteering with our local food pantry whose uh, needs have doubled ever since this pandemic has hit. Come out and volunteer with us. If you uh, want more information about volunteering, there's so many ways to volunteer in that food pantry. If you want more information, contact our uh, outreach director, Bob Weiss, and he'll give you more information. But in some way, love sacrificially. And I want to specifically challenge you in one area. Painful love. Um, I want to challenge you in this area. We have, in this time, been spending more time with our family than maybe ever before. And that might have caused a lot of tension in your home. And that might have made things harder for you in your house between you and your parents, you and your children, you and your spouse, someone in your family. 
I want to challenge you to take the painful step towards loving your family. Sometimes loving our family is the most painful step that we could take. Loving our family of origin. But I want to challenge you in light of sacrificial love, a step towards emotional maturity, stepping out of our perspective in our childish ways and loving towards Christ to step out of your perspective and to put a pause on your own agenda and your opinions. We have a lot of opinions about our family members, but I challenge you to step out. Husbands, forgive your wife. Wives, forgive your husbands. Children, honor your parents. As we get older, sometimes it's more difficult to bear with our parents, right? Honor them. Take that step towards sacrificial love toward them. Siblings, reach out to your siblings. Love them. Take a painful step towards sacrificial love in light of Christ. You believe in sacrificial love because that's how you were saved. Take a step towards it this week. Brothers and sisters, um, the Lord has called us to grow, to give up our childish ways. But the only way for us to do that is, as Jesus says, the seed must die. You must die in order to bless others. Step out of your perspective, the captivity of your own feelings, and step into uh, this world. And when you do that, you'll begin to inch into maturity. No longer a baby, no longer a child, but giving up your childish ways, beginning to develop your emotional muscles to be able to love. I pray that this week the Lord will bring us more into maturity and in doing so, not just bless us, but the people around them and around us. And so I challenge you and I bless you uh, to move forward in emotional maturity this week. Let's pray together. Father, uh, you have given us sacrificial love and you were the only one who didn't have to and be completely justified and be completely right. I pray, O Lord, that the message of the gospel would sink in, that you would help us to see where we are in our emotional immaturity. Maybe we really struggle with entering into the perspective of another person without judgment. Maybe we really struggle with using people instead of loving them, or maybe we are particularly having a hard time in the midst of conflict. I pray, O God, help us to see ourselves, to recognize where we are, to see our childish ways, and then move forward into maturity. And so in order for us to do that, we need a real conviction about Jesus, that this was really how we were saved. We were saved through sacrificial love. Father, you please press that upon us. Press your new family script of sacrificial love on our hearts and help us this week to take a step towards it tangibly and mature for the sake of the kingdom. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, right at this point, um, Mosaic, we're going to go into a time of offering and response. I want to remind you that the Lord is worthy of our worship, worthy of our praise, and also worthy of our giving. And so as I said last week, he needs nothing from us, but we love him and he deserves all of us. And so that's why we give. And so as we respond to him in our hearts and worship, I also pray um, that you would give generosity uh, to the Lord and give to him uh, the praise and the offering that he deserves. Let's worship him together.
Father, thank you so much for this day you've given us, a day where we should be together at the church, but we are so privileged to be able to do it online and virtually praise you as a community. What's going on around the world isn't a pause on our life, nor should we fast forward to the future, but during this time, to see how blessed we are because of your love, to take a walk and smell the roses that you created, to spend time with loved ones, and to be an even closer community. We confess that we are sinners, we're broken and emotionally immature, unknowing sometimes. We turn to distractions, things that we think can help us, things that we think can fill the hole that we have in our hearts. On a daily, we ignore you, God. We ignore our feelings and what you are telling us. Please guide us broken people to you. Thank you for waiting for us, never leaving us, and continuously loving us when we don't know how to love or receive love. Would you break our walls down, open up our hearts for your love, and wake us up to be in the presence of Jesus. I pray for those who are struggling right now, those who don't know where to turn to and why they are feeling this way. Would you send brothers and sisters to them to guide them back to you? I also pray for those who are getting affected by the virus, whatever may be happening in their life, that they would trust in you and your process, that they will be healed and be in your presence. Lastly, God, I pray for our community. We are all so different on different walks with you. I pray that we lift each other up, grow with one another, and spread the love you've given us to each other. Thank you for the blessings you pour onto us every day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above. Our mosaic, as we close, I want to remind you um, that the Lord loves you and that the Father has given you this new script of sacrificial love. And as I give you the benediction, may you feel his love over you as he promises to watch over you. This is his benediction from your new father into whom you have been adopted. This is the benediction which belongs to you through him. Receive it now. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, always keeping his eye on you and giving you peace through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. If you're still with us, let's praise to the fullest. I wasn't done talking. Let my voice, let my voice 
Flip it. I just flipped it. <laughs> what? You flipped the camera? I like this one because then I can't do it. No, don't do that. <laughs> I can do that. That's a little better. What if I do it diagonally? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh! Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two, three. <laughs> 